Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Tesla Motors Incorporated Second Quarter 2015 Financial Results Q&A Conference Call. If anyone should require assistance during today's call, you may press star then zero on your touchstone telephone for a live operator. As a reminder, this conference may be recorded. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Jeff Evanson. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Huey, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Tesla's second quarter Q&A webcast. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Tesla chairman and CEO, J.B. Straubel, our CTO, and Deepak Ahuja, Tesla's CFO. Our Q2 results are announced in the shareholder letter at the same link as this webcast. As usual, the letter includes GAAP and non-GAAP financial information and a reconciliation between the two. During our call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements, which are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent Form 10-Q filed with the SEC. And now, Huey, let's go to the first question, please. Yes, sir. And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to queue up for a phone question, you may press star, then one, on your touchtone phone. I know our first question will come from the line of John Murphy with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, good afternoon. Um, just a, a, a first question on the pre-owned program. It seems like there's a fair level uh, of a success there with $20 million in revenue. I'm just curious if you could dimension how many vehicles were sold through that program, how many units remain uh, in inventory there, and if we think about how that inventory is restocked, sort of what percentage of new unit Model S's that are, that are purchased are accompanied by a Model S trade-in? Hang on one second. Um, hi, John. Deepak here. Uh, you know, uh, firstly, we just kicked off the program uh, in April, so it's actually been pretty heartening to see how it's uh, done so far. And you know, to keep it at a high level, um, we 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 were actually we are actually selling these cars at a faster rate than uh, we are getting uh, these trade-ins to come in. So as this program picks up, it's going to really be a successful program, and and it's creating good demand for us on the pre-owned side. Yeah, and uh, I mean, just, it, I, I'd hesitate to make predictions um, based on uh, such early history, um, but I mean, I think there's there's room for optimism in the future here, um, because these these are obviously very low. They, they, we don't we don't have to make the car, so we're essentially getting a commission on selling the car, um, and it's it's very capital efficient. So, uh, you know, I think there's um, some upside potential there, but but nothing we want to sort of really make predictions on until we have more of history. Yeah. Oh, okay, but maybe, maybe to think about it in, in, sort of in terms of, you know, I mean, the every vehicle that's going into this pre-owned program, I would imagine, is accompanied with a, a new Model S sale. I'm just trying to understand how the acquisition process is working. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we accept a trade-in only when that customer is buying a new Model S, if that's what you're trying to suggest. Yes, yeah, that's what, sort of what I was trying to get at and understand the percentages, but I guess it's too small right now to, to be too material. Yeah. Um, then, then just a second question. is so we think about the, re, the referral program, um, you know, an interesting, you know, marketing angle here. Just wondering if you can sort of juxtapose what you think the ultimate cost was. It looks like it's about $2,000 all in versus your acquisition cost for a customer. And just trying to understand where you're going to, save money and how this makes the, the, the sort of the customer acquisition process more cost effective? Um, well, it's, it's not necessarily making it more cost effective. It's intended to be somewhat of a wash so that uh, if, if we achieve a $2,000 savings, we essentially pass that on to the end customer. Um, and, um, and, and we don't know what that's really going to look like until the program is complete, which is not, you know, sort of almost 90 days from now. Um, I mean, early indications are quite positive, um, but, um, but obviously, you know, for, for this 90-day period, there's going to be some overlap where we essentially incur a dual expense 
for because we're not, we, you know, we, we still have all of our stores and and we're, um, you know, have, have the referral costs. So uh, I don't think it's going to have a big impact on our numbers, but it's there will be some dual expense because there's no way to, you have to kind of run these experiments in parallel. So there's no real way to um, do it otherwise. And how did you build up the $2,000 acquisition cost? Because, as you mentioned, it seems like it's a lot of fixed costs that wouldn't get taken out that quickly um, in, the, in the test phase. I'm just trying to understand how you think about that $2,000 number and how you come up with that. Yeah, it's, it's not taken out in the test phase. It's, it's to inform our long-term decision uh, in, in terms of how many, how many stores should we open. I mean, a store should be thought of as like a demand generation um, item. And... Uh, in order to understand, should we do a lot of stores, small number of stores, somewhere in between? We kind of need to know how this referral program, how effective a referral program is. Um, I mean, if you can think of some other way to, to do this that we're, we're not aware of, we'd love to hear about it. Sure, we'll, we'll brainstorm on that. Then just, just lastly, um, as we think about, you know, the, the cash burn uh, in the quarter, but also the setup of the credit lines, it seems like, um, you know, you guys are recognizing that, you know, at some point down the line there might be a need for a capital raise. Um, you know, would you consider an equity raise in, in the market, or do you think these credit lines are enough to lean on for now before, you, you know, you ultimately have to make a decision on, on raising capital in the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, we only drew down $50 million on our credit line, so we have – um, sufficient um, lines available, and that's expandable too to 750, uh, which gives us some comfort that uh, we can be you know, close to a billion dollars as we go through the year. Um, and clearly, as X uh, ramps up and gets to steady state, it enables us to generate uh, free cash flow. Uh, so we feel pretty comfortable overall um, on that front, um, and you know, um, we'll just take it. Um, you know, as, as opportunities come in the future. So, Deepak, do you think as, as you go through the, the launch of the, the Model X and ultimately the Model 3 that you'll turn cash flow positive at the right point where you might not need to do a capital raise going forward? Is that kind of, kind of how you're thinking about this with the credit lines on top? Yeah, I mean, we are comfortable with the cash levels. So I'll put it that way. I don't think that there's, that there's not a, a need to, to raise equity capital. Um, there may be some value in doing so as a risk reduction measure, but um, but to be clear, we we what Deepak is saying is that even in the absence of any additional capital uh, generation activity, uh, we would have uh, on the order of a uh, billion dollars through your you know basically that that would be our minimum cash position. Yeah, no, I think the ri the risk reduction function is, you you mentioned is probably the most va is the most valuable, and that's kind of why we we're asking about that when you look at you know the cash burn and and you know how the capital markets sometimes shift very quickly. It just seems like an opportune time to, to take advantage of what you might need in the future. So that's why we're asking. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think, I, I think we're in the same sort of mind frame as you are. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Our next phone question will come from the line of Rod Lash with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, everybody. A um, couple questions. Uh, first, maybe you can just elaborate a little bit on the, the, the drop in the forecast from 55,000 to 50 to 55. Is, is there some aspect of the Model X launch that isn't what you projected? Um, it doesn't really sound like this is related at all to the backlog of orders for Model S. Correct. Uh, I mean, we, we do think that uh, it's going to be quite a challenging uh, production ramp on the X. Um, and if we are faced with a choice of uh, deliver great, we, we only want to deliver great cars. So we, we don't want to you know, drive to a number that's a, a, you know, greater than our ability to deliver high quality vehicles. So, um, and, and, and the, the nature of the, the production ramp, which is basically an exponent, exponential ramp that then, that then uh, becomes an S-curve, uh, is that you know, basically for every uh, week that, that longer that it takes us to climb up that exponential um, is about an 800-vehicle uh, reduction of the, of the X. 
Um, but but that, that's why we sort of do do want to um, emphasize the longer term, long term really just meaning meaning like you know Q1 next year type of thing. It's not super long term. Um, I think if one gets a better picture of the business, uh, just sort of thinking about that, and that's where we we feel really um, you know highly confident of the 1600 to 1800 combined uh, production of SNX um, and and. Both, both production and demand. Okay. The, was there an adjustment from something like 2,000 units a week to that 1,600 to 1,800? And um, are, are we thinking about like a 48-week uh, production year, or are you thinking about this in terms of a full calendar year? Um, yeah, so that, that's a good question. It's like that there – yeah, for, that's um, averaged over the year. So – that, that means, like, in, in a given week, we might we might go as high as 2,000 um, to make up for holidays, um, you know, fac factory retooling and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, your um, run rate of gross margin, obviously, it's being affected by a number of things, uh, by launches, by mix, the deferral of autopilot revenue. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what are some of the issues there? What What is the issue with autopilot? Would we would it be reasonable to expect the margins to rise again to uh, the the twenty five percent plus level once X is out and and Giga Factory begins to ramp? Um, hi Rod, yeah, definitely. Uh, the the most of the autopilot deferral, uh, we should be able to recover that later this year. There may be a small portion going into twenty sixteen, but difficult to say at this point. And um, um, you know, the two big issues that have been affecting us, I'd say, is the dollar, the, the strong dollar, and then the mix, especially as we have started to build 70D and the 70 cars recently. The dollar has had a huge impact um, just from Q1 to Q2. It took 100 basis points out uh, for us, uh, roughly. Um, so even after we consider all that and we look at 2016 to say that we'll be at 25% uh, and better, uh, with SNX combined, yes, we should be there. Okay, and just lastly, you've had a few more weeks here since the announcement of the stationary storage business. Do you have any additional thoughts on how that's expected to ramp? Um, yeah, I, I do want to bracket this with uh, you know, some degree of uncertainty because um, that this is quite new. Um, and, and again, we've got that challenge of um, you know exponential ramp and then depending upon how you move the on, on how the dates fit over an exponential ramp, the actual numbers in a given quarter could be quite uh, quite different. Um, but um, the, the demand has been really crazy. Um, so it's it's uh, well in excess of, I mean, if you just take the, the reservations uh, that have been made thus far, it's for well over a billion dollars worth of uh, power packs and power walls. So uh, and that's with uh, no marketing, no advertising, um, no sales force to speak of, really. Uh, we've not tried to sell it. It's basically a presentation and a webcast and three minutes of press Q&A. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's probably room to improve. Yeah. Um, the, in, in, so this is, I mean, we're, we're really, it's, we're basically sold out of um, what we could make in 2016 at this point. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, assuming these orders are real, um, which they seem to be. Um, so we're looking at maybe, uh, again, you know, just breakfast with, with meaningful uncertainty, uh, 40 to 50 million in stationary storage in Q4, um, and, and maybe as much as 10 times that number in, in for next year. So it's, yeah, 40, 40, 40, 50 million you know, this, this year um, and, and 10x that next year. And, I mean, that, that growth rate is probably going to just, you know, keep going at, at quite a nutty level. Um, it's, it's, it's probably at least a few billion dollars in 2017. Um, it's somewhat speculative at this point, but it, I think that's, uh, that's likely. So it's, it's sort of growing by um, 
half order of magnitude to an order of magnitude per year. Great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. And now our next question will come from Trip Chowdhury with Global Equities Research. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Thank you. A, a couple of questions regarding the validation units. I was wondering regarding Model X, uh, do we have a general ballpark number in terms of how many validation units we may have to produce before the robots become smart enough? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand your question. Um, like when, when we had the Model S retooling, we created a few Model S validation units, I think probably around 40 or 50 units which were used to train the robots. So sure. uh, before the product really goes into production, I do believe there are some validation units of the car that are produced so as to train the robots. I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. So that, that, that's true. There are actually, it, it's, it's a little more complicated than that because there are parts of the factory that, um, that, that are much more automated than other parts. Uh, so there's, you know, in terms of the, ro the programming, the, uh, the, the, ro the robots, it varies quite a bit in terms of uh, how much programming there is, uh, uh, how difficult the programming is. Um, but, um, but we actually have, uh, you know, now produced uh, several Model Xs off the, you know, the, the Tesla production line, um, but they, they, this is a complex machine with several thousand unique components. So there are still a lot of uh, low volume parts from suppliers on the Model X, um, and but with with each week we we, we keep building more and more Xs off the line um, with greater and greater part maturity. Um, and um, and then, uh, as, as our letter says, we, we expect to do our first uh, delivery of production Model Xs at the end of next month. Excellent. Uh, I had a question also on the autopilot. Uh, I was wondering, are you, are you aware of uh, this research paper from Alex? I think they also call it AlexNet. In few conferences we went, they talk a lot about image classification, especially with NVIDIA. Uh, and if you haven't heard about it, that's fine. But if you have heard about it, I was wondering, uh, are we working with some similar technologies with autopilot, or we are doing everything in-house in terms of image recognition and auto steering? Uh, the, the overall system is designed by Tesla, um, but then there's components from a number of other suppliers. Um, the, the autopilot that um, or the auto steer highway, highway autopilot essentially uh, is using a combination of the uh, the Ford camera, Ford radar, um, the side ultrasonics, uh, and then the the GPS navigation system. So it integrates those four systems in order to um, do uh, auto steer on the uh, on the highway. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's. Uh, that's what we're sort of working out the final details on. Um, we're targeting um, release to our early access customers on August 15th. Um, and then depending upon how that uh, is received um, and what issues we encounter in different uh, parts of the world, uh, we expect to go to wide release on autopilot, uh, high autopilot and, and auto park uh, in uh, one to two months after that. Last question is regarding the calendar year 2016 uh, production. I was wondering, uh, in 2015, this current year, we are having a few uh, retooling and, you know, getting the, uh, the assembly lines or I should say the production lines of Model X and Model S little up and coming. Do we see any similar disruption happening in 2016 or we are pretty much straight? And when we will put the Model 3 line in place, it will be completely isolated from Model X and Model S. Um, th there are periodic um, down periods in order to do equipment maintenance, um, where, where that can't be accomplished in, let's say, uh, you know, or, or on a Saturday, Sunday. Um, but uh, we're not anticipating any any significant uh, downtime for 
SNX is a sort of, like maybe it's one or two weeks out of the year, some, something like that. Um, and that, those are, because we do, we do uh, productivity improvements uh, to reduce the, the, the production cost. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, just general equipment maintenance. Um, for the Model 3, we're, we're, we really um, are doing our best to make sure that it does not affect uh, SNX production. Uh, we, we don't currently anticipate it affecting SNX production in 2016, uh, but there may be some effect in 2017. If I may squeeze in one more, uh, you did mention that Model X production is challenging. Uh, like there's a difference between saying doable and undoable, and everything is challenging in the world. Like uh, I was wondering, like we have a control over this challenge because every problem is, if it's not a, if we never enjoy something, it's not challenging. You're saying it from a challenging, like it is out of control, or challenging because you're enjoying doing it. Well, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, some things are definitely a lot more challenging than others. Um, and I, the Model X is, I think, a particularly challenging car to build. Uh, maybe the hardest car to build in the world. I, I'm not sure what would be harder. Excellent. Um, but, it, but it is an amazing vehicle, and I, I think it's going to blow people away. Looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next question in queue comes from Adam Jonas right, with Morgan, Morgan Stanley. Your questions, please. Hey, Elon Deepak. Um, first question, uh, Steve Jurvinson was recently uh, quoted saying that Uber CEO Travis Klanek told him that if by 2020 Tesla's cars are autonomous, that he'd want to buy all of them. Um, <laughs> is, is this a real – I mean, forget like the 2020 for a moment, but is this a real – business opportunity for Tesla supplying cars to ride-sharing firms, or does Tesla just cut out the middleman and, and sell on-demand electric mobility services directly from the company on its own platform? That's an insightful question. You, you don't have to answer it. I, th I, think, I, don't think I, I don't think I should uh, answer it. Okay, we, let's move on. Um, second question is, there's been, sometimes you can tell more from the non-answer than from the answer. Um, there's been a lot of excitement about mapping technology from, uh, for autonomous and semi-autonomous applications uh, with the German consortium bidding firm for here, Nokia's business. So we'd love to hear your views, Elon, on, on how you view Tesla's mapping capabilities. Is this something you need to license, continue licensing from outside vendors, or can you use your own uh, unique, connected, um, uh, machine learning fleet to build your own mapping capabilities and be self-sufficient. Can you, or, or would you rather not answer that? <laughs> um, well, I, I, the, the fact of the matter is there is not publicly available data that is sufficiently accurate for full autopilot. Um, you know, as far as navigation data, street data, it's it's too coarse. Um, so it, it looks like we. We don't really have much choice but to uh, create our own data set for driving uh, in order to, uh, uh, in the long term, in order to um, provide uh, a, a high quality autopilot experience. That's uh, awesome. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, that's just, that's just the only way we can think of to, to do it. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, sir. And it looks like our next question in queue will come from Ryan Brinkman with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Uh, first question is, you know, I'm just curious what the, the new guidance, uh, you know, for a range of deliveries, uh, 50 to 55K versus 55K prior, what does that mean, if anything, for the, the earlier target of free cash flow break even in 4Q? Is that something we should think about maybe uh, more in, in 1Q16 then? Certainly in 1Q, we will be free cash flow positive. Um, Q4, it's hard to predict given that range, uh, certainly towards the end as Model X um, um, deliveries are ramping up, um, we would be. But then if you look at the full quarter, it's somewhat close to call. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, that's helpful. And then just last question. You know, it seems like we've seen a number of announcements intra-quarter now by, by utilities and, and other companies. 
about using your, your power pack, uh, you know, companies like Amazon, etc. Um, I'm curious, how much of the Tesla energy business do you now expect to generate from corporate or institutional demand uh, versus um, more retail customers? I'd be interested too if, if this mix uh, and expectation, if it's changed uh, over time at all since you first debuted the product. Um, sure, this is JB. You know, we're, we're getting a little bit better sense of it, but it's still early days. And, you know, I, I think uh, initially we thought that the majority of the business would be uh, the power pack and the commercial or institutional business. And, you know, we've actually been a bit surprised at how strong the power wall, uh, the retail uh, demand is and the interest is. So, you know, I it, again, it's hard to guess at numbers, but I would say that, you know, we're perhaps in the maybe not quite close to 50-50, but it, I think 70% perhaps power pack. Yeah. It, okay. It's really early days because a, a big dependency here is when, when someone orders a power pack, how many power packs do they order? Um, and, you know, because so power packs are 100 kilowatt hours and, uh, but, you know, industrial and uh, utility customers may order as many as 100 or 200. Uh, I'm not sure what I, what's our biggest one so far is that like 200 and uh, yeah, single site on that yeah on that order makes you yeah yeah so so I think our biggest one is around 250 or so so that it, 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 yeah it, it could be quite quite a large in terms of kilowatt hours quite quite a large amount going in the direction of power pack in terms of unit volume the power wall would be the greatest but um, but but the likely thing for power wall is somebody's going to order maybe one to three, maybe it's average of one and a half or something like that, whereas power pack uh, you know could be an average of five to ten. Um, yeah, and I, I think as as the market grows and as as we go further into the future, we're going to see you know more and more total energy demand coming from power pack. That's still our expectation. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, a real important thing to uh, understand. Uh, I mean, it's maybe worth drilling at this a little bit. Um, that uh, for stationary storage, the, the fundamental economics of cost um, are, are always true, uh, meaning that uh, the, the um, there, there is always a, a cost advantage to someone imp to, 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 to a system-wide implementation of stationary storage because of the high peak to trough. Uh, Electricity usage. So, um, if you have buffering, which is what uh, stationary storage allows for, then you you only need your power plants to operate at the average energy usage, which means that you can you can basically, uh, in, in principle, um, shut down half of the world's power plants if you had stationary storage. This is independent of renewable energy. It does not matter wh whether you have solar panels, wind, or it, this is just just being able to uh, shut down half your power plants if you have buffering, because you can then have your power plant output at the average of what is needed by uh, the, the consumers. Um, See, that's like, very it interesting. Seems like, yeah, it seems like sometimes people link this too much to renewable energy, of course, we were huge believers in renewable energy, but uh, that is not the getting function of, of demand for uh, stationary storage. Um, it, stationary storage is really as compared to, to existing power plants. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and then like depending on the country, that 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 may be represented at the at, as a price to the user of the electricity. So, for example, in Germany and Australia, there, there is uh, time-based uh, cost of, of electricity. You know, it's like cost more sometimes today than than, than others. Um, whereas in, the, in most of the U.S., that you just have a, a meter that's ticking over, so it it, it doesn't differentiate between. Uh, say, day use of energy or night use of energy. So in places where the price represents the cost, the power wall 
makes economic sense. Um, but the power pack makes sense everywhere. Great. Thank you, sir. Our next phone question will come from Patrick Harsham with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Your questions, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, you know, just wanted to follow up on the autopilot, and I'm sorry if you guys have said this, but, you know, can, can we talk a little bit more about the capability that that's going to bring? Is that, you know, kind of a hands-off, feed-off kind of product that would be somewhere close to, like, NHTSA Level 3, or are we just talking about, you know, kind of more lane keep assist and, you know, forward collision warning, that sort of stuff, that, that would still be kind of one to two. Um, you know, let me just start off with that question. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with what the various NHTSA levels mean, but I, I'll tell you just what, what it will translate to in um, the initial autopilot. The, we, we don't want to set the expectation that it's that, that you can just basically um, uh, pay no attention to what the car is doing. Um, we, we do want to set the expectation that it's much like the autopilot in a plane, where you turn the autopilot on in a plane, but there's still an expectation that the pilot will pay attention to what the plane is doing um, and, you know, won't, won't sort of go to sleep or disappear from the cockpit. Um, so we do want to set that expectation with consumers. Um, that said, in terms of what the capability of the system is, I, I think its capability um, in steering and control of acceleration and braking is, 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 is excellent when it has a tracking vehicle in front um, and, um, you know, you could basically have high confidence uh, in steering, braking, and acceleration when, basically, when you're in some kind of traffic situation where there's a, the, there are, there's a car on the road in front of you. Um, I think it's, it's pretty good in the absence of that. So if there's just lanes, it's pretty good. Um, and um, and it will get better over time as we refine the software. So that this, I would certainly not take the initial version of Autopilot as the final version. It will just get better and better over time. Got it. No, that's just, helpful. Just, just, just with software updates, just with software updates, to be clear. Yeah. And then I take it there's some kind of, you know, human-machine interface thing that keeps you focused and beeps if you try and use your BlackBerry or something. Um, that, that's still something that we're debating, and I think we want to see how the uh, early access program goes. That's basically our public beta, um, and um, and based on on that, uh, we'll set the warning levels. Um, yeah. Got it. Um, more of a, a guidance question. Um, you know, it was touched on earlier that you know the 16 to 18 is down from I think what was you know being floated around as 2,000 for for next year's production level. Um, you know, I, I get that the production overall might be lower based on a slower ramp, but is, is there you know something structural that's you know keeping you from hitting that 2,000, you know, as, as on, a, on a run rate basis, understanding that you can kind of surge to that at certain points. Um, is there something that, you know, kind of in preparing for the launch, you've realized that you're just not going to have the capacity that you thought you would have? Um, well, frankly, the, the main thing is we, we don't want to set – you know, you know, high expectations, and then th that then the, the only way for us to feel good about the future is that if we exceed really high expectations. So it's sort of like um, winning needs to feel like winning, um, if that makes any sense. Um, so that that's really what um, you know. Why, why we're sort of setting those numbers. Uh, could, could we do 2,000, uh, you know, aspirationally? Yes. Um, do, do we want to commit to that? Uh, ideally not. Um, yeah. Um, got it. Un un understood. Just setting the bar at uh, achievable levels is something that makes sense. Um, and, and just last one for me, like a, an accounting issue. I think there was like 
a 10 cent gain or a 13 cent gain on like FX revaluation? Like, uh, I don't know, Deepak, what, uh, I didn't know what that was exactly. Yeah, that's driven by our balance sheet currency um, and receivable um, revaluations that happen at the quarter end exchange rates. It's not really, it's not representative of what happens during the quarter, during in the middle of the months, and uh, based on where the exchange rates were, we had um, good news this time from that um, revaluation. Clearly, as you are aware, Q, Q1, we had um, significant bad news. Um, and if you really net the two out on a full year basis, it's a small number. Okay, got it. So it's just the impact of uh, transactional stuff sequentially. Yeah. Okay, got it. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, sir. Next question. Just to clarify, there's translational and transactional in the sense that we have foreign currencies on hand, which we are translating to dollars at quarter end, and that impact has to flow through income. Right, but it, 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 we haven't actually done the exchange. Yeah, right? in, yeah, it's it's unrealized. There are right. there is some realized portion that happened during the quarter. Most of it is unrealized. Yeah. All right. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Emmanuel Rosner with CLSA. CLSA, please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, wanted to wanted to start just with a, a quick math question. So uh, your comment suggested that um, the um, if there is an, any sort of delay uh, towards the end of Q4, this would have an impact of about 800 Model X uh, units per week, and then you're also guiding to about 1600 to 1800 uh, combined volumes of production per week um, next year. Does that just simplistically mean that? Um, you're targeting uh, the mix to be roughly 50-50 between X and S right from the get-go in 2016? Um, it, it, it does, although it's, it's, I wouldn't put too much precision on that because um, what, what we're going to try to do is to uh, push, push the production slightly more in the direction of X because people have been waiting for a long time for their cars. Um, and then, you know, in, in any given month, it could be 60, 40, one way or the other. Um, if you look at worldwide demand for SUVs and sedans, it's almost dead even at 50-50. Um, and you know, some some regions, sedans are favored, some regions, SUVs are favored. Um, but, but generally, it's uh, on a worldwide basis, 50-50. Um, but it, it is difficult for us to say exactly what... Um, what, what the SX demand ratio will be uh, until the car is out there and people are experiencing it, and we see what the um, relative order volume is. Um, but, but we have we have we have um, so many advanced orders on the X that um, this, this is certainly not, not going to be an issue in the early days, and, and we are going to try to uh, get people their car as fast as we can. Okay, so I understand the uh, the demand aspect, but I guess from a production capacity point of view, you think that um, as of uh, early 2016, you could theoretically um, have as many X as, uh, as Model S is being produced? Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, to, to sort of put our cards on the table here, I mean, we're setting um, factory capacity to be 1,000 a, a S's and 1,000 X's per week. This, but this is capacity, you know, what actual production and capacity are, are, are not exactly the same thing. So uh, there's always, you know, some percentage lower than uh, the capacity that is, is you know, or, or like occasionally you may hit capacity, but but it's hard to maintain capacity. Um, but, but you know, our our goal is um, what our, what our what our internal plan is. I can tell you is is that. We want the factory to be able to make up to a thousand X's, up to a thousand S's um, per week next year, uh, and in, in terms of capacity. And then, actual production, you know, is affected by real-world issues. So there will be, you know, maybe some weeks where there is two thousand produced, and some weeks where there's um, you know, very few produced because we've got factory tooling situations. 
hence the 16 to 1800 average over the year that we're predicting. I think it would be fair to say the goal of the factory is to not just produce cars, but it's to produce cars with the right cost and the right quality. Yeah, yeah. The, the, well, particularly, I mean, once we hit steady state, we can certainly, uh, you know, do that. But it's it's just difficult difficult during the ramp ramp phase. Yeah. Okay, that's very clear. And then uh, one question on China. So uh, very happy to see um, that uh, your revised strategy is. Uh, getting some traction. So what exactly are you um, doing differently there, I guess, besides offering um, uh, a home charger for, you know, the buyers of Model S? Are there any other things you're doing differently in China? And any lessons that um, you can learn from there in terms of, uh, you know, applying that to, to other regions? Well, it, China is, uh, you know, ha does have a, a unique set of challenges. Um, the you know, for, for example, is the whole license plate question. Um, you know, to get a license plate to drive a car in uh, a lot of the major Chinese cities is quite difficult. So whether um, you have the electric vehicle exemption in a given city or not makes a big difference because um, if you don't, then people can buy the car, but they can't drive it. Um, so we've been it, – it's taken us a while, but we've been successful in getting um, – EV plate uh, exemptions in you know ev everywhere except uh, Beijing, and we're optimistic about Beijing uh, receiving Beijing ex exemption uh, in, the, in the future, in the hopefully near future. Um, so that, that that's important for for China, but not something that one can extend to to other parts of the world. Um, the uh, I, I think the yeah I mean it's I, I think it, it, I think it's really just that. In China, and, and in most most countries, that the that there is a bit of a slow build of awareness and competence in Tesla, um, and depending upon when we went to market in a particular country, um, the, the that that feeling is going to be at a low or or a high stage of maturity. In in say in the U.S., uh, say particularly California, it's a high stage of maturity. Um, if the awareness and comfort um, with Tesla in California is very high, um, and, uh, and but you know that that's sort of a, at a moderate stage of maturity in say the northeast of the United States, um, and still at the low stage in in most of Asia, um, uh, and and the, the same has been true in Europe. Basically, it, it seems like with, with every with every country you've, you've got to um, you, you've got to build confidence in the brand over time, um, and it it just takes time. You can't just have it be immediate. And just because people love it in in California does not mean they automatically love it in other places. Uh, you, you, you just, you've got to build the confidence over time. Sure. Yeah, we've been in China now only slightly over a year. Yeah, it's just a year. So. Yeah. Um, understood. And then the final one, just on the on the Gigafactory. Um, can you just give us an update on uh, you know how things are going there in terms of uh, uh, the the preparation, and then there was also, um, as, uh, I think you you've been mentioning a, a, a bunch of hints throughout you know throughout the months on uh, potentially uh, wanting to add some space there, uh, you know, adding some uh, you know capacity. Can can you talk, um, I guess, more precisely in terms of, uh, you know, w where would you see capacity go uh, beyond sort of like the uh, the, the initial stages? Uh, yeah, I'll. I'll Say a few words, and maybe JV can weigh in. I mean, um, whenever engaging in speculative speculative comments like this, I think it's, it is important to just remember they are speculative um, and not not, uh, not 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 a prediction that we would have, say, with with very high confidence. Um, but, but what we have found is with, with the gigafactory is that as, as we spent as we spent more and more time on it, uh, we've we've found we've been, been able to um, Improve the space efficiency um, of the of the production and, and the overall efficiency um, by more than our initial expectations. Um, so the net net result is is that we think in the same volume we can do potentially significantly more uh, output. Uh, JB, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I think our, our plans are, are still on track and unchanged for the first 
you know, phases of production to support Model 3 and to support the Tesla Energy business, but the ultimate production capability of the site um, is, is what we, you know, believe can go much higher than we maybe initially thought it could. Um, and, uh, and, and we do remain on track for construction at the site. Um, you know, we'll have uh, first equipment, you know, being installed at the end of this year and planning to start production on Tesla Energy products uh, in Q1 2016. In, in, in the Giga Factory, well, we're, we're yeah, already in production. So we in Fremont, clearly. Sorry. Yeah, we're already in production uh, with Tesla Energy products in Fremont, but that production will transfer to the, the Giga Factory next year and expand and ramp significantly. Yeah. Perfect. Great to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next phone question will come from the line of Brian Johnson with Barclays. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Your questions, please. Uh, good. I'm got two questions, one on the power wall, excuse me, power pack opportunity and then another uh, relating back to Model S, Model X. Um, on the <coughs> power pack, I um, <coughs> want to get sort of a deeper understanding of where you see your competitive advantage, if I think about simplistically four levels of a stack in terms of the utility power pack solution with the upper level being sort of the grid software to interface with the grid, kind of tie in when's it needed, when's it's not needed. Second layer, the battery management software, and then at the hardware, the inverter and other power electronics followed by the battery itself. Um, where do you see your advantage at each of those levels? How is it important to play at all of those levels? And how do you interface um, <laughs> with some of the existing middle people, you might call them, or consultants in the industry or other software providers? who might be providing elements of the stack already? Well, it's a, it's a pretty detailed question. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, maybe at a high level, one of the biggest benefits that we offer and where we have a competitive strength is having a system that, that solves pretty much all of those problems together. I think a lot of other people aspiring to be in this market, you know, sell one piece um, among that entire stack, as you're calling it, and then you'd have to go to different companies to find the other pieces. You know, at, at Tesla, we're integrating all those pieces together for a, a very, you know, turnkey solution that you know a utility or a commercial customer can can just install. Um, you know, I think. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. Basically, plug and play matters even if you're at the megawatt scale. Yeah, exactly. And I think, of course, you know, the pricing fundamentals, starting with the battery itself, are, are really the, the foundation of that. But you know, we have a lot of expertise and a lot of, uh, you know, know-how in power electronics and software as well, you know, that we've built on the car side of the business for many years. And how about the software to interface with the grid and determine um, when to charge, when to discharge? Yeah, that's something we're, we're working on you know, now, and we're also working in partnership with many different uh, utilities on this. You know, there's not a, perhaps a universal point of view on exactly where that, uh, where that control and, and sort of dispatch should live. You know, a lot of utilities want to be very involved in that themselves. So, you know, we're, we're basically setting up the tools and the, the infrastructure so that they can control in a way that's familiar and the most convenient for them. It's effectively like an and, and API. It's effectively like an API, yep. so that um, their, their a utilities system can can essentially call can can or put put or call power to the pack, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then they can, they can query the pack for uh, information about its status. Um, but as Jay was saying, like this, it does have to interface with uh, quite a heterogeneous set of systems around the world. Um, so that, that's why you have to have basically an API interface to, to the pack um, saying, you know, so that, that the utility system can request power uh, or put power to the pack. Yeah, and maybe just one more okay, and comment. You know, at, at the sure. commercial level, you know, that is something that Tesla is engaged in much more directly for things like demand management and, and those type of applications. but. It's a bit of a different answer depending on which market we're in here. And so how are you getting the utilities comfort with the cycle, number of cycles and the lifetime of this? Is, are, are they sort of taking your word for it or is that something they're 
seeking to explore through pilots and or their own high-intensity testing of your battery packs? Well, we have a lot of data, actually. It's not, they don't just have to take our word for it. You know, the, a lot of these tests have been running for a long time, and we can show them, you know, fairly hard cycle data and, and uh, some lifetime data. So that's been very helpful. And also, of course, there's, you know, all the sort of field experience from the automotive fleet. Uh, you know, that is much bigger than what we're deploying in the stationary fleet and, and will remain so for a number of years. So, you know, having the, the, the confidence there and how those batteries have aged and, and done quite well um, you know, is extremely helpful in building a confidence. Got it. And just final quick question, Model S, um, you noted some risk to 4Q depending on what happens with the X ramp up. Um, earlier in the year, you talked about a 30% gross margin for the Model S part of 4Q. Of course, that was not for 4Q overall. You know, where, where do you stand on that 30% internal goal now? Yeah, that 30% um, goal was before the dollar began to really strengthen at this level. So clearly that has had a fairly large impact on it. Um, and, and also the mix has in, had, had some impact. Um, our focus also in the last few quarters has been much more so on Model X. There are um, various other cost reduction opportunities that we have that we are hoping to get in Q4, but they could potentially get delayed into Q1. Uh, we want to make sure they happen right, and we are at the same time focusing on X. So I would say broadly, if we put aside um, exchange, um, we see a trend of improving gross margin uh, despite mix over time. Okay, but no longer a hard 30% in 4Q. Uh, it, no, not, 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 in, not next quarter, basically. Um, but next year, um, you know, contingent on macroeconomic conditions, um, not going wacky, um, that, that seems like a, you know, potentially an attainable number. Okay, thanks. Thank you, sir. Next question comes from the line of Colin Langan with UBS. Please go ahead. Your question, please. Oh, great. Thanks for taking my question. Um, can I just follow up on some of the numbers you threw out on stationary storage? Uh, the billion dollars, is that orders or reservations? I just want to get a sense of how firm that was. And did you imply that so it sounds like 404 to 500 million for next year, and is it a few billion for 2017 as the storage market? Is that what you said? Um, yeah, um, th these are these are reservations. So you can, um, you know, reservation maybe in order or, or maybe not, but that's certainly what people have said that they want. Um, the uh, yeah, so there's over a hundred thousand reservations uh, that have been placed for Powerwall and Powerpack, um, and of that, the uh, you know there's you, you can sort of speculate as to what, what the, how many power walls, how many power packs per, per reservation, it's likely to be more than one. So, uh, particularly in the power pack case. So, yeah, um, that, that's what leads us to think 40 to 50 Q4, maybe 10x that number next year, and then 5 to 10x the, that, that number in 2017. Um, but as I said earlier, the you know, as we get further away in time, the, the numbers are more speculative. Um, yeah. And where would that put you in terms of market share and storage at that point? I mean, that would be most of the market for stationary storage in 2017? Um, we don't really know. Well, it, I mean, the, the, the market is definitely growing very quickly, so it's, it's a yeah, bit hard. Exactly. We're, we're, I'd say we're speculating on what the actual entire market is going to do and how that's going to grow. So that's... Um, I don't think you can draw a lot of conclusions from, like, what what is the market? Exactly. You know, how many how, how much of the stationary storage was sold last year? Just just as at the beginning of electric car production for Tesla, people were trying to say, well, how many electric cars have been sold were sold last year? Uh, almost none. Therefore, Tesla will sell almost none. Yeah. That's 
to summarize what the vast majority of predictions were about Model S. Yeah, the, the prices that stationary storage, you know, was selling at last year, for instance, are, are so much higher than where they would be, or will be in 2017 that, you know, they're, they're, you can't extrapolate those two. Yeah, the, the, the demand for stationary storage um, increases at, at, a, at a sort of quite an extreme exponential as the cost uh, of, of the, the cost per kilowatt hour de decreases. Um, you know, the, the utilities used to think of like things in, in terms of levelized cost of energy, and uh, depending upon where you are in the world, that number uh, in some places is, is very high, some places is quite low. But as you start to approach the the, the, the average value, um, that the demand basically scales into the multi-terawatt hour range. So. Yeah, it, I mean, grid parity is kind of the wrong concept here, but it, it's maybe a somewhat of an analogy to think about. But at, at grid parity, the, the, the market is staggeringly gigantic. Right. And what is your all-in cost? I know it's 250 for the power pack. I mean, when you, with installation or anything, do you have any estimate of what it actually costs, like a commercial or a utility all-in? Well, it, it, it depends a lot on the, the scope and scale and how many other pieces of that installation are bundled together. So, so we haven't, you know, quoted or listed those numbers since they vary so much from from one st installation to the next. Um, you know, the, the battery cost is really what what matters most in the economics. So that's where we've listed those prices. And any sense of the the high end, low end range for an installation? Um, no, nothing that we, we'd be ready to share quite yet. Okay, and just last question. Uh, how should we think about the margin profile over the next few years of this ramp? I, I believe you said Q4 would be pretty low. Um, should that meaningfully improve, and when do you kind of get parity with your gross margin on the auto side? Uh, we, we are getting quite speculative about the, the battery business. But um, what the? I can't read your writing. Oh, <laughs> uh, 15%. Um, yeah, I, I think the, yeah, I mean, in, in the early days, the, the battery gross margin is sort of on the order of 15%. Um, but, you know, over time, that, that uh, could rise to 25% or maybe 30 percent, but we, we just don't know that quite yet. And um, we'd have to look at what the price elasticity of demand is to understand whether we should, you know, where, where should we be pricing and what's the, what's the right gross margin to aim for. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our next question in queue comes from Ben Callen with Robert W. Baird. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, as far as the, the Model X go, goes, last time, Elon, you, you talked about configuration in July, and I, and I um, understand with, with the slippage, but when can we start you know, thinking about configuring cars if we have orders out there, customers have orders, and then you know, with a, you know, about a month away from deliveries, when do you expect to show it to people? Um. We're probably um, aim, aim to offer configuration in two or three weeks of the X. Um, so that, that should go live on the website before the end of the month. In terms of the initial deliveries of the, the X, uh, that's sort of consistent with what we predicted uh, on the last uh, call, which is end of September. Okay. And then... Um, you know, as we look out to the target of 500,000 cars in 2020, and you know some of the things that you've learned recently, do you still st stand behind that number? And um, and you know what gives you confidence in, in looking ahead to that number and ramping up production? Sure, um, I I do, I, am, I do remain uh, confident about half million cars in 2020. Um, 
and you know maybe maybe being able to to exceed that. Uh, I mean, it's worth noting that if you know, so, 2020 that's five years from now. Um, if you go five years in the past for Tesla, we were producing 600 cars per year. Um, now we can produce 600 cars in three days. Um, so I think you're going from from here to 100, 000, to, from from here to 500,000 cars a year is a much smaller leap than what we did uh, over the past five years. Got it. And then when we think about your currency exposure, are you guys where are you guys at? I'm thinking about moving any kind of manufacturing um, outside of the U.S. or any parts of manufacturing or additional manufacturing. Well, it depends on what time frame. Um, you know, in the next few years, we expect to be focused on Fremont and uh, and, um, and the Gigafactory in, in Nevada. Um, long term, meaning like you know, again, okay, we're getting very speculative here, but you know, in the three to five year time frame, it's going to make sense. To for us to think about uh, localizing production in different markets, um, having a factory in Asia, a factory in Europe, um, uh, other factories in North America. So in order to you know, go, go beyond the 500,000 units a year, that's what we would need to do. So the, our Tesla factory and in, in Fremont and in uh, New Reno is that sort of size for the fiber K level. Um, might be able to do a little bit more than that, but but say um, fiber K should be very achievable. The, the Numi fact, when, when it was operating as Numi, it, it did roughly half a million vehicles a year. So for us to do a similar number it, it is, is you know just quite reasonable, I think. Um, with that, without adding new factories. So the new factories would be for going past a half a million. And my final question, uh, a headline after this call might be, you know, Tesla is going to raise capital. Um, just from your comments, uh, I think that some people are going to walk away thinking that, and I just want to make sure that you guys can set the record straight if that's, you know, in the, in the cards uh, in the near term or if it's not. Thanks, guys. Um, unfortunately, we, we can't comment uh, on, on that specifically. So, all right, next question. Yes, sir. Our next question comes from the line of Andrea James with Doherty and Company. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Um, what have you learned or discovered between the time when you set that 55,000 unit goal and I guess now when you're saying it's better to have some more breathing room on the ramp? And also, I guess one more, just along with that, is there any supplier in particular that's concerning you? Um, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to sort of name specific suppliers, um, but um, I, I mean, our biggest challenges are with the second row seat, um, which is it's, it's an amazing seat, like a sculptural work of art, but a very tricky thing to get right. Um, the falcon wing door actually seems to probably not be the not, not be a, uh, a critical path item. Um, there are some interior components, interior trim, um, that that are possibly on the critical path. But it, it, it's it's always hard to say exactly what what lies in the critical path because it tends these things tend to pay a uh, schedule leapfrog, um, and it, it's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a set of constraints that, you know, one day it's this constraint, then the next day it's another constraint, um, and the, the, but the, the pace of progress um, is, is really dependent on which supplier is the slowest and least lucky. Um, mm -hmm. So. You know, if a supplier has unexpected challenges, um, which can 
range from force majeure to uh, simply having to redo a design because the, the initial design was wrong. Um, the, the, when you have a complex product like the Model S with thousands of that's dependent on thousands of suppliers, you can say that, that the, the pace of progress is determined by the, th the thousandth least lucky and slowest. Um, but if we knew in advance which ones those would be, we, we would uh, take action. Um, so the, yeah, it's. Um, no, that's helpful. It's, I it's, think everybody understands yeah. that you're an yeah. investment in Tesla is, is a company that's learning as it goes along. So it's always interesting to see what you're discovering as you attempt to to build. Um, the other thing. Can you walk us through what you accomplished during the factory shutdown in the quarter? It looks like you really did a lot of work in, in one week. Um, can you help us understand the significance and then also maybe paint it in terms of what you're doing in the factory this year that's going to actually be repurposed or can be, even be used toward Model 3 production? Um, yeah. Um, so the, the, the retooling was both for the X as well as for improved efficiency of S production. Um, and I think we've got a lot accomplished there. Um, for Model 3, um, the biggest single item is the, the paint shop. Uh, so the, the paint shop is sized to be able to do 10,000 cars a week. So we've laid the foundations for for that uh, that rate in the paint shop. Um, I think that there's also room for um, significant increases in our foundry um, in terms of casting um, and uh, we've, we've also made a significant investment in stamping um, and some, some advanced uh, metal sheet forming technology that isn't stamping. Um, yeah, is there anything you want to add to that? I think in um, plastics and paint Especially paint, yeah, uh, we made paint, modifications yeah. there on the on the existing paint shop. We're, we're getting the new one ready. Um, I think we essentially added capacity in many different shops you know, ahead of Model X, uh, which required some production interruption to do it right, uh, including getting our production control and inventory management processes much better. Um, and you just can't do that when production is running. What about the drive unit, um, investments in the drive unit manufacturing? Is any of that small drive unit going to be used for Model 3, or it seems like you're really scaling up there? We've certainly learned a great deal going from the original Model S uh, drive unit to the uh, small drive unit, or it's called the small drive unit. Um, it's dramatically easier to build. It's much more automated. Uh, that said, I think we would uh, we are, we will do a, a further revision for the Model Three, um, and essentially go to the third generation production technology for the Model Three. Yeah, maybe one thing to keep in mind is the small drive unit. Uh, you know, capacity is is quite in excess even of vehicles because of all-wheel drive, and you know, is that is is ticked up. You know, we've increased the capacity of the small drive unit and production that you see as well. Because you need two of them. Um, yeah. And then finally, I guess, Deepak, I'd love for you to stay as long as possible, but I'll just ask this anyway. Um, what's the status of your CFO search? <laughs> uh, we're interviewing candidates uh, all the time. Uh, Deepak is part of the interview process. And um, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're, we are talking to some interesting candidates. Um, if there's anything more to say about that. No, I mean, uh, no, clearly I'll stay around to ensure there's a smooth transition and uh, uh, we're continuing to talk to lots of candidates and make sure we find the right person to come in. Okay, thank you. Actually, do you have any progress on regional heads of sales? And then that's my last one. Thanks. Oh, uh, well, um, yeah, we, we do have a regional head of uh, sales for Asia, uh, who came to us from EMC, um, and then you know there was some press about um, I had a North American sales who came from Burberry, and then yeah, 
just because we have like one person from Burberry, then people think we're copying Apple, which is ridiculous. Uh, it, he's, he's great, but uh, <laughs> it's just one guy. Um, and uh, and then we're, we're continuing to search for our head of um, Europe sales. Thanks so much. Thank you, ma'am. And we do have one additional question in the queue. Looks like our last question in the queue comes from the line of George Gallus with Evercore. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my question. I have a strategic question for you. It looks like in the next two years we'll see a host of new and improved battery electric vehicles from your peers, ranging from mainstream models from the and GM to more premium vehicles from Audi and Porsche. Strategically, how do you think about future electric vehicles from other OEMs? A, do you view them as a threat and competition in a limited EV market? B, do you view them as contributors to the common <laughs> cause, raising awareness of EVs, overall consumer EV adoption, and hence the EV market size? Or C, given certain compromises of the competitors' efforts to date, do you actually see them as the opposite? i.e. they form negative prejudice in consumers' minds with respect to electric vehicles, costs, practicalities, and performance? Um, I think this is the first multiple choice I've gotten as a question. Um, I think if you just look at uh, our comments in the past, what we've said is like we're um, really excited to see other car companies do electric vehicle programs. Um, you know, what's been, what's been done to date is not much. Um, they've generally been fairly small programs um, and, and often just set to achieve a regulatory minimum. Um, so uh, that that's, hasn't been great thus far, but I am encouraged by what I see about their future plans. They sound uh, like they're headed in the right direction. Um, and um, I would be super happy to see the whole industry go electric. Uh, and you know, we, we have open sourced our patent to, so, so that those wouldn't be an impediment and perhaps it could be helpful. And uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be really great if the whole industry would just go electric as soon as possible. Um, in fact, I mean, our, our view is that the whole industry will go uh, electric. Eventually, they really won't have much choice. Uh, but the sooner they go electric, the better. Cool, very clear, thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, I think that was the last question in the, in the queue. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll talk to you next quarter. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you gentlemen and thank you ladies and gentlemen for joining us today. We hope that you found today's event informative. This will conclude our call. You may now disconnect and have a wonderful day.